Today we're going to be discussing pharmaceutical facility design from receival all the way to final product dispatch in a GMP compliant manner. Now to do that, we need to focus on certain flows, namely the flows of the materials or the actors throughout the facility, the flows of the personnel in and out different rooms, as well as the flow of materials for packaging and the waste in the facility and its way out. Now we're going to focus also on batch manufacturing records in the process, validation and cleaning validation in the facility. And this is all really important to me because I believe in elevating the standard of botanicals in the global arena and its manufacturing, where if you don't apply certain GMP principles and pharmaceutical standards, you're never really going to activate the medicinal benefits of botanicals and African botanicals. And that's a big focus of why I'm having this discussion today with our wonderful guests. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Estia, and it's great to have you back again for a discussion. We're going to talk today about GMP considerations around facility design. Uh, I'm a big advocate of QBD, quality by design, spend time in the beginning, uh, map the flow of everything. And today we really want to focus on the flow. But before we get into mapping the flow around the GMP facility, Estian, could you tell me a bit more about um, how you think about it when it comes to like critical and non-critical areas within a pharmaceutical preparation or manufacturing area? Hi, Jeff. Great to be back. Yes. Um, so look, there's there's many ways that you can look at criticals and, and non-critical areas. Um, depending on the product that you'll be making, you know, you need to consider different aspects of it. But I think to summarize it, a nice way of looking at it is anywhere where there is direct um, air contact or human contact with your product should be seen as a critical area. Um, it's a very summarized version, but it, it sort of lays out a picture of um, you know, when you're looking at your facility design, which areas you should focus on as critical. So, for example, if something as um, if you already have a finished product and it's been closed in a secondary container, there's no direct air contact or human contact that would be seen as non-critical. Um, if you have a primary packaging room or an area where either you as a human will touch the, the product API or excipient, um, you know, you might you might uh, consider that as critical. Yeah. Uh, as well as your your airflow, you know, if that touches the product directly, um, hopefully it's done through a proper HVAC system, but it is also seen as a critical area. 100%. You mentioned the word excipient. Just explain to anyone who's not in the pharmaceutical world what an excipient is. So essentially, an excipient is a um, an inactive substance um, that goes along with your actual active substance substance or your API, your active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, I mean, it can be anything from a coloring agent, preservative, a glidant, um, you know, bulking agent, whatever it may be. Um, but it forms the inactive part of your entire product. Yeah, 100%. So that's the, the good examples always have something like paracetamol, where you've got 500 milligrams in a tablet, but obviously if you weigh the tablet, it's not 500 milligrams. So what makes that tablet a tablet is all these additional excipients, stabilizers, etc. So that it can ultimately go into a tablet press, be pressed out, <clears throat> sorry, at high volume. And then you've got yourself um, a carrier for your active or your API. So now I want to talk back to the facility because that's what we're here for today. Let's start with personnel because I think it's really important that people understand a bit about, you know, how personnel gets introduced into a facility in terms of their gowning requirements, the overshoes, the head nets, uh, the, you know, prep, basically scrubbing into a facility if a surgeon is watching, as an example. And then also how certain areas are staged and, you know, the separation between certain areas. But let's start with personnel and then we'll get into materials and waste and cleaning the rest. So personnel is absolutely critical. Um, when I get to a new facility, I always look um, at design in, in a sort of a step format. So the first thing I always look at is the actual process requirement what needs to be done to get the product out in terms of, um, you know, equipment and the processes involved. Secondly, I look at personnel flow. So that's how important this is. Personnel flow, after that would be material flow, and then you look at your more operational and utility sort of maintenance side. Um, but, you know, personnel flow is, is absolutely key. You don't want your personnel, personnel to be um, using the space incorrectly. Um, you don't want them to be causing any sort of cross-contamination, which is one of the most important parts of your personnel flow. Um, and you essentially want them to move from a less clean to a clean area and, and keep it that way. You, the one thing you don't want with your personnel is for them to move from a less clean to clean back to a less clean area without the proper guarding procedures, because that's how cross-contamination works. Um, another thing to consider with personnel is um, segregate them into their specific dedicated areas. Um, so you don't want, for example, the 
same personnel working in your primary production area as compared to your secondary production area, unless there's a very robust gowning procedure in between, but then you also are not following lean manufacturing principles because there's obviously time wasted and your personnel has to walk up and down. So, you know, the right, the right segregation is also critical um, and then alongside that, the right gowning. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I always say the more practical considerations are if you're employing uh, personnel operators in a GMP area, one of the first questions you need to have is, uh, do you have a small bladder? Because uh, if you've got a small bladder, there's a concern because you've got to go out and in of the facility to, to get to the ablutions. And the other thing is, do you smoke? Because uh, if you're a regular smoker yeah. and you compulsively smoke, you, you just it just doesn't work, practically speaking. So these are the kind of things to really think about. It's almost like going in to be in a theater for the next four hours until your lunch break and then gowning out, gowning back in for the next four hours. And that's that's really a practical way to think about the personnel requirements because you can't just be, you know, shredding PPE all day because that will add up to your bottom line and lean, you know, lean manufacturing there, you're gonna you're gonna hurt from uh, that gowning and PPE materials, especially in this current post COVID world or still COVID world. PPE is always still under pressure in terms of supply. Now let's talk about materials because I almost want to have us loop from receival through the facility storage, its utilization in the facility, all the way back to, let's call it final product uh, dispatch. Take us on the journey around materials and material flow and maybe material airlocks. Perfect, and, and this is really crucial. Um, one thing I see a lot is people make the mistake of not having enough space for the receiving and dispatch areas. Uh, and because of, of the process, so potentially when you receive products, you need to prove that this product is of sufficient quality before it is brought into the production facility. So therefore you need holding area and you need areas where you can de-dust, inspect, whatever you need to do for your specific product. Once it's been approved through the proper documentation and inspection, it needs to move into a holding facility. Depending on the type of material, um, it will go into specific rooms, either graded or not. Um, so for example, your secondary packaging material um, will never touch the product, so that can be stored in a specific room that's not graded, whereas your primary packaging material or APIs would go into an area that is obviously under HVAC or graded control. So once it's in the facility, um, it has to be secure, um, it has to be access control. Um, as it goes through the process, you would obviously um, have the necessary steps and procedures to bring them into the facility, check the right quantities. When you're done with your product, and this is now where we're moving into the sort of dispatch area, um, we all, I also always see that people don't have enough space here because it's one thing to have space for the product that you're going to be releasing. But then again, you have to remember your product's not going to be re released immediately. You're normally awaiting results or you're waiting documentation approval. So it needs to have an area where you can store it, quarantine it, or you can call it quarantine for release, whatever process you have in place. Um, so that has to be there. You also have to consider space for your sampling, your return products, your rejected products your products on hold, your um, customer complaint products. Yeah, so and you've got to demarcate yeah. those areas as well. So you've got to already exactly. think about it in advance. So it's it's absolutely correct. And I mean, the biggest thing we see is the micro results, you know, waiting for micro release on certain products that you don't realize that often you're sitting for days on end, if not weeks in some cases with certain micros, uh, if you're not using a rapid release method then you're gonna to have to sit with inventory. Um, and even more so is the consideration if you're dealing with a narcotic, uh, that you need a vault for those narcotics. So that flow is also somewhat impeded. So you've got to size accordingly and plan your dispatch to, to correlate to that. But please continue. Exactly, and you don't necessarily have to spend a ridiculous amounts of money in having a specific room for each of these. Once a product has been packed and it's in its final form, um, it's protected, you can segregate your rooms with pages or specific ISO paneling, whichever way you want to do it, um, you have these dedicated areas. So that's one thing to consider. Another and the last thing to consider here is your actual physical dispatch space. There should be a dispatch process with a proper documentation, just as you had when you came in with the receiving of the product that should be checked with and with regards to the, the, the um, full of quantities um, as well as the quality of the product before it is sent to dispatch. So this, that is really things to consider. Look at your space, look at your design before you go into your receiving and dispatch areas. Yeah, and remember, they also need to be separated areas. Uh, so there's no chance of uh, the switch-ups and the mix-ups. Uh, and one other thing is also work with your suppliers and vendors because often like pre-request COAs, certificates of analysis for materials coming in, 
Uh, having to dig for the boxes, open the packaging, not ideal. If you can get a digital version of the COA in advance, that's amazing because it just allows the you know procurement team to organize and stores to organize themselves accordingly uh, to just be very efficient. Um, so that's awesome. Let's talk about waste. I mean, this is now there's waste generated at different stages in the manufacturing process, even possibly uh, unrelated waste in the packaging area. How do we handle wastes? What are the procedures there in terms of that? And then we can maybe with the waste flow, talk about requirements around cleaning and how to prepare and when to have cleaning. We don't just leave cleaning reagents maybe in certain areas that are critical unless required to be placed there. Talk me through waste and cleaning. Perfect. So you, you would have different types of waste as you are correctly mentioned. Or packaging or secondary component waste, where there's actually no direct product um, associated with the waste, can be placed in separate bins, um, like a, a lined uh, a liner bin that you can easily move out, and then you would have a process of taking that to a specific um, dedicated waste cage. Your primary waste, so the waste that's actually your active material, um, has to come directly from your production rooms, of course. But I would ideally look at moving that into a wash bay and then either through the wash bay or through a very um, seamless process into another waste cage. So that's because obviously when you have active products, you have higher risk of contamination and cross-contamination. Uh, another thing is you have to have the appropriate contracts with a, a certified approved waste management company that provides you with the right containers for your specific product. So once you put a product into a waste container, you don't want any of that product escaping again. That's something people don't always consider. Um, you know, and then once it's stored, it will never be at risk of cross-contamination. So cleaning normally happens just to bring the cleaning aspect in, um, either between batches or between switches of different products. So if you're going from one product to another product, you would have a specific cleaning process in place. That's when you also generate um, some of your final waste from the batch that was manufactured. So depending on your product, if you're running the uh, same product over and over again, you would have to do the appropriate studies to determine uh, the amount of time between cleaning, but it essentially ties into your waste flow as well. Yeah, 100%. I mean, this always goes to me uh, when I think about uh, almost intensification of manufacturing. So continuous processing versus uh, lock defined batch or discrete manufacturing. Uh, and I see this more in the sterile space or the considerations there, where you know if you're going to do continuous flow, you you having a bigger lot size or batch definition, but that also introduces risk because if you get it wrong at any stage there, you, you can't rework the batches easily. Whereas uh, if you define your lots and you define that clearly, it allows you to come in with cleaning, clean the surfaces, prove that you've restored it to its original state. Uh, you'd have to do all the associated uh, you know, validation on the cleaning as a topic we're probably going to talk about separately because there's a lot to say about cleaning validation. But I, I like that. And also agree with you on the waste because you don't want to, if you're using, um, let's just call it a specialist company to remove certain wastes, uh, there's quite a procedure. You might even need to allocate your own personnel to resources around the, the destruction of that waste, uh, which takes time. So cost and time means that you've really got to be discerning about what is critically like waste that you want to destroy with a supplier and what is not product facing or touching so that you can work around those kind of, uh, you know, saving costs in terms of the, the control of your waste. Yeah. The one thing I want to add to the waste that's also really critical um, in, in any sort of manufacturing industry is batch your batch details. So the quantity that you produce um, normally has to match up with the amount of waste that, that you um, generated from that batch. But this is something critical because the auditors are always going to look at your waste log. So you need to make sure that you've got the appropriate measuring technique for your waste to say, this is the amount that I've actually um, got rid of, and this is the amount that we got out of the batch. So if you put them together, it should give us you know, the total quantity that we put into this batch. And if those numbers don't match up, you know, things um, obviously that does not look good from an auditor's point of view, and they want to understand where the materials went. So waste traceability is something that people don't speak about a lot, but it's extremely crucial. Yeah, I love that point. I mean, this it kind of goes to, I'll use an example in aseptics, you know, when, when all of a sudden they use four times the amount of filters they were supposed to, to manufacture a lot which they had done previously means there's been some kind of problem, uh, which means either the product has started to precipitate for some unknown reason, or maybe the operator made some mistakes, which means they go to the operator training files, uh, and it creates a nightmare for, for the QA department, because it's like, where did we go wrong in terms of quality assurance? And you're right about that. Traceability around uh, waste management is one of the best ways indirectly 
to assess if there's a problem in the manufacturing of that lot. Uh, so fully love that point. It's a good one. Um, so now I'm going to jump to do something people often overlook, and that's the associated testing uh, within the flow. So if we talk about the facility, we've talked about waste personnel. Uh, we could talk about preparative and final production areas, but let's focus on testing for now because very often I see the situation where it's like the, the testing lab is just put somewhere and it's like the flow to that testing lab either goes across the working area or working room or the flow doesn't make a lot of sense. So talk to me about the positioning of analytical and microbial testing labs. You know, I know the GMP guidelines say keep it away from production uh, and also talk to me about sampling frequency and how that gets the labs. Uh, I think it's a good topic for people to understand a bit. Definitely, and it's a topic a lot of people um, get wrong in this industry. So I think a, a really good place to start at is defining your, your critical process parameters and your critical um, quality attributes. Because that will determine where you're going to have to do your testing. And be it in-process testing or you know for annual or retention sample type testing, um, it, it tells you exactly where you need to look at. So once you know where you're going to be doing your testing, you need to look at your facility design um, before it's commissioned and obviously implement how are you going to move those samples into the lab without moving from a clean to a dirtier area. So you, once again, like I mentioned earlier, you don't ever want to go from a clean to a dirty area, especially with something like samples, which is your, your obviously your active substance. So yes, you're 100% right. Um, following the, the PICS and EU guidelines, your, your labs has to be segregated from your production areas. So one of the good ways, one of, there's a couple of ways, but one specific way to do it is through material airlock so, or a transfer hatch, which yeah. is obviously pressure, pressure regulated. So um, you would have a specific sample taken in your production area. And then instead of going out of your production area, there would be a, either a hallway or a room where you have a hatch that leads into the, the, the necessary lab that needs to be tested. Um, you also need to consider the size of your retention sample that you're going to be taking um, and if it's going to be tested on site or if it's going to be tested externally. If it's going to be tested externally, they have to be just to actually pack those samples um, you know, in the necessary packaging areas before it is transferred. So sampling is incredibly important um, and, and also sampling the correct way with the correct quantity. So have a look at the PIX Annex 19. I think it goes detailed into um, that's the EU, sorry, not PICS, the EU guidelines, I apologize for that, um, Annex 19, um, that goes into detail regarding sampling. I know the PICS guideline also has a sampling um, annex, I don't remember the name right now, but it will be available online. Yeah, 100%. If anything, we can drop it in the comments below uh, after this video goes live. Um, so to this point, I mean, I think we've covered a lot here. I mean, there, there's a lot to be said more. I mean, we've had some discussions as well around, you know, the pressure cascades, the validation of the air handling units, the HVAC. We will have more on cleaning validation as well as water quality. I think we're going to we're gonna talk about facility and wrap it here. Obviously, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more of this in the future. So if you are looking to reach out to Estian, please do so. Uh, I, I go to him for a lot of engagements around this. Uh, we have a similar background from traditional pharma. But we really want to see herbal botanicals benefit from that knowledge base and that sharing. And uh, thank you, Estian, for making the time to share this with a broader audience so that you know people can really learn from... Our, our time in the industry, our de I want to say decades, but uh, yeah, it's a decade plus for me. But I know that it's one where, you know, it's good that, to see young blood in the industry trying to really just move everyone in the right direction in terms of quality assurance, because this is why we do it. You know, at the end of the day, the quality of the medicines that are being manufactured is what we're both passionate about. And I want to see more botanical medicines coming out there to compete with single drug molecules. And uh, it's going to be an exciting future for African botanicals. I absolutely agree, and I think um, what we're doing now, and we you know we were touching on the subject, but there's a lot more detail to it. And, and uh, I think the main thing we want to carry over here, especially from my side, is that before you start looking at building out your facility, you need to consider this. My retrofitting is always going to give you some some trouble, and it probably will end up, um, you know, affecting your, your capex a lot more than you thought. So um, what I would recommend is, like Jeff mentioned earlier, quality by design. Let's think about these processes. Let's think about the flow before we design this. Um, and yeah, I mean, I absolutely love discussing this with you and, and I appreciate your time as well. Awesome, Mercian. Thanks again for your time.